We'll begin recording. <coughs> Today, our goal is to get through renal physiology. Uh, I cut it down to the bare essentials. This is going to be one of the more important ones, I can tell you right now, because the other cohort just got done with renal pathophysiology and treatment in their, in their other class, and they're like, oh, my God, that was hard. So what you put in now will pay dividends later. Um, then we're going to get into fluid and electrolytes. More on fluid, less on electrolytes. And then we're going to start acid base. All right. Our goal with acid base is going to be to get you to a point where you can do acid. You, ever, you guys ever done acid base problems? Okay. So get you to do those. And then I'm going to screw you all up in spring semester and tell you that that's not how it's done. So we'll get you to a midpoint, and then we'll complete it in your clin med class. Um, and then Friday, we will finish acid base. We'll probably do the problems Friday. And then muscle physiology. I don't want you to put too much effort into muscle physiology. Okay? This way more important. All right? And I can't say you didn't hear it from me because I'm recorded saying it, so there's evidence. All right, so kidneys. When we talk about renal, we talk about the kidneys. And uh, so you guys had a lecture on the kidneys when you guys did the, the first two weeks uh, with urine formation. And that was just an overview to get you ready for what you were going to do in the clin diagnostics class with uh, um, dipsticks. Did you guys all do a dipstick? It's fun, right? It's a party. All right. So when we talk about the kidneys, uh, is that me or you? Must be you. All right. It's not me. It's you. Um, we have the renal cortex and the renal medulla. When we get down to it, what we really are concerned about is what's happening at the microscopic level. The nephrons, that's going to be your functional unit of the kidney. That's what's going to do all the stuff involved in, because uh, what do the kidneys do? If you had to give kidneys a function, what would you say they do? What's their one, one, one function? Filtration. Filtration, okay. What are they filtering? Blood. Blood. So I would say even more so, kidneys clean the blood. Why do you go on dialysis? To clean the blood. Right? So really, they, what they do is clean the blood. Um, sometimes getting that concept across to undergraduate students, they don't understand the fact that when you're filtering stuff, you're actually filtering the blood. So this is what we're talking about. So it's these nephrons that are going to do that job. And in order to do that job, they have to have a blood supply. In anatomy, you've already... Uh, um, shown, you've already seen... You know, the renal artery, renal vein. Uh, speaking of that, what is the problem with this picture right here with the renal artery and renal vein placement? Another word. Go ahead. Were you saying something? You, it's Lindsay. It's backwards, right? Because what's in front? The vein. Sweet. So you're looking at the back side of the kidney. All right. So you have the renal artery. Um, and I'm not going to have you go through this whole pathway, just FYI. I'm proving a point. Renal artery, that splits into interlobar arteries. Then that splits into interlobular arteries. I'm sorry, arcuate arteries. Then interlobular arteries. And the interlobular arteries are going to feed uh, many, many afferent arterioles. All right, so it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and one interlobular artery will feed many, many afferent arterioles. And the reason I mention that is we are going to be focusing on just this area, afferent arterial through the glomerulus and the efferent arterial. Because 
that's the business end of why blood is going to the kidneys. So we need to know what's happening in that area. All right, then of course, the veins come back along the same pathway and out the renal vein. All right, this is just another diagram of the same thing. Again, highlighting the fact that afferent arterial glomerular capillaries, efferent arterial paratubular capillaries. All right, what I want you to notice about this picture of the nephron right here, and we'll go through the different parts, is that uh, you have a bunch of capillaries here and a bunch of capillaries here and a bunch of capillaries here. Anytime you see structures surrounded by a lot of blood vessels, what's going to happen there? Exchange, right? So think that a lot of exchange happens um, between the kidneys, I'm sorry, not the kidneys, the blood vessels, and the tubules that are part of the nephron. Is that okay? Should I make it smaller like I usually do? I just realized that I have it full screen. Or is it good? Good for now. Good, good for now. All right, so with nephrons, our kidneys have about a million each, about a million nephrons each. All right, so if we're filtering at the microscopic level with one nephron, then we multiply that by a million, then we're talking about milliliters of uh, fluid that's being filtered. All right, uh, and it has a certain order. So we've already talked about the afferent arterial and the efferent arterial, and we'll go into a little more specifics about that. But they go into a capillary network called the glomerular capillary network. All right, glomerulars. Gl 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 glomerulus. All right, and whatever is filtered out of the blood from the glomerular capillaries goes into this capsule right here called the glomerular capsule. Now, you've probably had this elsewhere and heard it called something else, right? Bowman's capsule. Fuck Bowman. <laughs> All right, you'll hear that. That's an older term. I like glomerular because it describes where it is and what it's doing. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I have a real disdain for scientists. Like, how arrogant do you have to be to name something after yourself, you <laughs> douchebag? <laughs> All right, so uh, you filter the fluid into this glomerular capsule, and then it goes through this network of tubules, all right? Uh, what else do I want to say? All right, whatever doesn't get filtered here goes back out through the efferent arterial, and then is involved in an exchange that occurs in what we call the nephron loop. You may have heard of that called the <laughs> loop of fuck Henley, too. Okay? Um, if you want to use those terms, if that's what you're familiar with, go ahead and use them. I go with glomerular capsule. I go with nephron loop because functionally it makes more sense. All right. So the fluid that leaves the glomerular capsule ends up in this convoluted tubule known as the proximal convoluted tubule or PCT because it's close to where the filtration is happening. So remember proximal means closer, distal means further away. Then we go through the nephron loop. We have a descending limb and an ascending limb, and different things happen there, and we'll talk about what those are. Then we go into the distal convoluted tubule, or DCT, because pathwise speaking, it's far away from the origin of the filtration, and then into the collecting duct. All right, And all those collecting ducts go into the medulla. They all converge on one another at the renal papilla, and go into a minor calyx, major calyx, renal pelvis, ureter, and that's how urine exits. All right, I think we have a picture on that later. All right, so we have two types of nephrons. Most of what we're going to, we're not going to talk about the specifics of each type, but one, which is your primary functioning, 80% of them are cortical nephrons. That means most of the nephron is within the cortex of the kidney, cortex, medulla, and only the loop goes down into the medulla, whereas, uh, and that's going to be, that's going to do most of our filtration, our cleaning of the blood. Then we also have these juxtamedullary nephrons, where the capsule and the PCT and the DCT are in the um, uh, cortex, 
but the they have a longer nephron loop that extends all the way down into the medulla, and that allows, and that's only 20% of nephrons, that allows you to uh, 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 balance your water volume in your body. All right, but we're going to talk about all of them as if they are the same thing. All right, we're general practitioners, not nephrologists. All right, you are me. I'm just some dude up here drinking coffee and talking. Who pretends to know what he's talking about? All right, so when we talk about the process of your information, what is urine? You guys already had this. Water, plus all the crap we want to get rid of, right? Waste, excess water, excess electrolytes. Uh, and there's three processes that go into them, the making. Urine, all right? What is urine is what we call what's excreted. Uh, being brown is not on purpose. I just pulled that out of there. Like, never mind. Bad uh, digestive system joke. We have glomerular filtration. Plus tubular, uh, plus tubular secretion. Minus tubular reabsorption. All right. So whatever blood, whatever fluid, fluid is filtered by the glomerulus, plus whatever the blood is putting into the tubules after the glomerulus, minus whatever the blood takes back in, because we're like, whoa, 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 you can't get rid of all that. I need some. Okay, that's what goes into what's excreted. So these are de general definitions of what tubular reabsorption is and what tubular secretion is. We'll talk about them specifically as we move along. All right, there's your equation. Same thing. All right, glomerular filtration. All right. We're filtering. When we filter, when we filter coffee, which is the best kind of filtration, <laughs> what are we doing? We pour water through coffee grounds, right? We get stuff that comes out and stuff that stays behind. Okay, that's by definition is filtration. So we're thinking of water and everything that's dissolved in water filtered out. And then anything that's too big to be filtered stays in. And what usually is that? Red blood cells, white blood cells, large proteins, most proteins. All right, so by the end, the filtrate is similar to blood plasma minus the proteins. Right, and we've talked about what plasma is. All right, in order to do this job, we have to have a highly regulated process. So what we already know, we haven't talked about it yet. We'll talk about it next Wednesday. Is that capillaries are leaky, right? Any capillary in the body is already leaky because you have to get stuff from the blood into the tissues. And the glomerular capillaries, this red part, they're no different. Right? They're still leaky. They still have holes in them. In fact, they actually have bigger holes called fenestrations within the capillary wall that allows more stuff to be filtered out because the glomerulus is doing a very specific filtration function. All right? Just outside of that, so here's our capillaries, endothelial cells, these fenestrations, which is slightly different than what we'll see in normal capillaries. That's all surrounded by a basement membrane. And what are basement membranes made out of? Connective tissue, proteoglycans, sugars, things like that. All right, but still, fluid has to go through that. So is that going to filter stuff? It's kind of like, you know, you put rocks down to filter, but then you put sand underneath it. So this is like the sand. All right. Then outside of that, we have these other cells called podocytes. Podocytes means little foot cell, foot cell, little foot cell. 
uh, that are surrounding the glomerular capillaries and they interdigitate with one another. So you see uh, these little finger-like projections from one, another coming from another, from another, that form little slits on the outside of the basement membrane. And those are called slit membranes. Or just slits, just call them slits. All right, and it turns out that the slits are the most important filtering component because they're the last thing between what's coming out of the blood and what gets put into the glomerular capsule. All right, so slip pores is what I was thinking, slip pores. All right, so if we have these capillaries and then we have this basement membrane and then we have these slip pores, the only way we're gonna have protein in our urine is how? If we have that many layers, like we have the rocks, the sand, and then we have, uh, let's filter paper under that. What's the only way we're going to get proteins through that? There's an injury afterwards. If there's some sort of injury to that membrane, right. What might cause an injury to this membrane? High blood pressure. High blood pressure, thanks would be one, all right? Uh, high protein diets that actually damage the membranes, that can happen as well. Any kind of inflammation, nephrotoxins, things like that can damage those. And once you start seeing proteins in the urine, that means your filtration unit is compromised, okay? All right, the important part. I like to draw it this way. And you can steal this if you want. We have our afferent arterial, our efferent arterial, and here's our glomerular capillaries. All right? And here would be our capsule, which is going to contain fluid. All right. Um, are your kidneys kind of one of these things that like get turned on and off? Like we're going to filter now and then we're going to stop filtering? Get, no, it's continuous. So one of the things that I want you to realize, even though this is drawn like it's empty, all of this is filled with fluid. And that's going to be important to, re and here, down the tube, to remember because that fluid is going to apply a pressure. And when we talk about pressure differences and what favors filtration versus opposes, this fluid in here is actually going to oppose filtration. Kind of like, you know, when you put a beach ball in a pool and you push down, right? That water is pushing back up. So this fluid is pushing fluid back into the capillaries. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. The important part here is afferent arterial, efferent arterial. What do you notice about the difference and how I drew it? Afferent's larger diameter, efferent smaller. What does that mean? Okay, let's not think about pressure yet. Let's think about flow. More flow in, less flow out. All right, so if you have a bunch of fluid, if you have three units of fluid going in and one unit of fluid going out, what's the pressure going to be like in those capillaries compared to if I had three going in and three going out? You're going to have a high pressure, okay? So you have a high pressure in your glomerular capillaries because you have more fluid going in than you have coming out, all right? So that creates what we call a filtration pressure. All right, whatever doesn't go out, red blood cells, proteins, things like that, go through the efferent arterial, and then those go into those paratubular capillaries, and we'll talk about what the exchange is uh, occurring there. But for right now, more going in than going out, high filtration pressure, pushing fluid out, whatever's left over gets put into the efferent arterial. If I took all my fluid 
out of a capillary and only had proteins left over, forget that cell, cells don't take part in this, and I had proteins left over, what's that going to do to water? What do proteins do if you have a high protein concentration here but not here, where's water going to go? Towards the proteins, right? So whatever proteins are left are also going to suck water back into the capillaries too, or fluids back into the capillaries. So that's going to exert a pressure as well, and we'll talk about all that in the next couple slides. This slide, actually. All right, so with this high filtration pressure, we've got, let's say, I don't care that you know these numbers. We can make shit up. 10 units of pressure going out, okay? And then let's say we have, because of these proteins in here, we're pulling about five units back in, okay? And then because this fluid here is also pushing against the capillaries, we have another two units pushed back in. So overall, we've got 10 coming out, seven going back in. Our net filtration pressure is three, right? So what does that mean? It's a positive three. That means are we sucking in more in or pushing more out? We're pushing more out, okay? So we're pushing more out. All right, like I said, these numbers also serve the same purpose. I just wanted to use something that was easy to think about. I don't care that you know the numbers. You want to get into nephrology and learn those numbers and how they work? Have fun. Actually, it is. I like the kidneys. Um, all right. So what that leads us to is a discussion of glomerular filtration rate. The higher the pressure, the higher the rate. All right. So anything you do to increase the pressure, outward pressure, in the glomerular capillaries is going to increase your glomerular filtration rate. Now this is important because one of the things that you will see in every patient's chart is a glomerular filtration rate. And that will give you an indication of what? How well their kidneys are working. How well their kidneys are filtering. Good. You'll also see glomerular filtration rate for African Americans which if you actually go and read the literature is complete BS. Like it's, it's something they use, but it's, it's not even true. So if I find that article, I'll send them to you. It's really interesting. Um, where was I? Pressure rate, increasing rate. Okay, let's do this. Despite the fact that we already have a high filtration rate, each of these arterioles is also surrounded by smooth muscle. All right, and what does smooth muscle do? Contracts, okay? So, I will ask you questions about this, okay? If I were to constrict the afferent arteriole and we know that pressure equals GFR just to keep in mind decrease afferent arteriole what happens to GFR? If I decrease the di diameter of my afferent arterial, what happens to my G GFR? Pardon? It decreases. Why? No? Okay. What did I use before? Three? Three. Because instead of three units going in, I may have now two units going in for every one unit going out. That means there's less back pressure 
and less overall pressure, therefore GFR goes down. Right? So, same logic, what happens if I relax my afferent arterial? What happens to GFR? It increases because I'm letting more blood in. Four units compared to the one unit going out. So we're going to increase our overall pressure if nothing happens to the efferent. All right, we're keeping that static. Um, turns out both of these are constantly back and forth. We're just doing proof of concept, okay? What happens if... I constrict my efferent arterial. What happens to GFR? It you would increase. Why? I go from three units in, one out, to three units in, to maybe half a unit out. <laughs> so that means I'm letting even less out. More back pressure, greater GFR. So if I open up that efferent arterial, GFR goes down because I'm letting more out. Does that make sense? You've got an angry, confused look. No, I get it, but like, wouldn't there also be... There's a lot of factors that go into it. This is just one of the things. This is called auto-regulation of renal blood flow. Okay. All right. If the afferent, all right. Uh, first of all, if there's any confusion about this, afferent means going toward, efferent means going away. Away. Right? I always tell students, afferent toward, efferent, actually a former student came up with this, efferent, F, F this, I'm out of here. <laughs> All right, and we're talking about it in relation to the glomerulus right here. So if I increase the diameter of my afferent arterial, more blood going in, higher GFR, right? More's being filtered. If I constrict the afferent arterial, less is going in, GFR goes down, all right? It's the exact opposite for the efferent arterial. If I constrict my efferent arterial, less goes away from the glomerulus. That means it's going to back up and cause a higher pressure, higher filtration rate. If I dilate my efferent arterial, more goes away from the glomerulus. That means less back pressure. GFR goes down, okay? So whatever's happening Afferent, the opposite is happening in efferent when we're talking about GFR. All right, that's independent of uh, uh, um, capsular hydrostatic pressure. That's independent of osmotic pressure. Okay. So... This is an interesting thing. We uh, assume we have three liters of plasma, not of blood, because we already learned we have like four to six liters of blood, right? Three liters of plasma. And we uh, filter that 60 times a day. Our kidneys filter our plasma volume 60 times a day, all right? If that's three liters, that's 180 liters that our kidneys are filtering per day. It's a lot, right? Like that's... 92 liter bottles of Mountain Dew. I don't know why I use Mountain Dew because, but 92 liter bottles. But we only produce about half to three liters of urine a day. So what does that mean? Everything that most of what's filtered does what? Goes back into our body, okay? So most of it's reabsorbed. That's important to remember because if we got rid of all that fluid, We'd either die or we'd have to, like, hook ourselves up to a water hose.
All right. Um, I think we already went through this. So uh, this afferent, efferent arterial, the reason why we want that to auto-regulate itself is to make sure that our GFR stays relatively constant. So if blood pressure goes up, we want to be able to maintain a, we don't want our kidneys to be affected by that high blood pressure, so we auto-regulate how much blood is actually going into the afferent arterial. All right, so that's the purpose of this constricting and dilating thing. All right, so since we already went through it, I'm not going to cover it anymore. Uh, this is showing you the same thing. Like, we've already been through this. I like, I like drawing pictures, so, like, I get ahead of myself. All right. But it turns out that it's not just happening at the level of the glomerulus. We also have um, external forces that can also exert effects on these uh, smooth muscle cells in the afferent, afferent arterial. Okay, so what we have here is the drug or the um, hormone or the neurotransmitter. What stimulates it to affect the autoregulation, what effect it has on GFR, and what it has on renal blood flow. Okay, we're more concerned about GFR here. So, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, just a couple of examples. If we have a decrease in extracellular fluid volume, that's what ECFV means. For example, hemorrhage. That would get rid of extracellular fluid, right, really quick. So if we have that, our sympathetic nervous system is going to detect that, send signals to that afferent arterial and say, whoa, we got to constrict because we're losing blood. You, you can't be filtering that much right now. All right? Stop. So your GFR is going to go down. All right? And your renal blood flow is also going to go down because it's going to constrict the renal artery to make sure not as much blood is going to the kidneys because you need to conserve it. All right, let's... How about natriuretic peptides? Uh, does anybody know what those are, first of all? Natriuretic peptides. Something to do with sodium and urine. That's what natri, sodium, N-A-T-R. What's the symbol for sodium? N-A, right? Uretic urine peptides. So what these generally do is say when there's an increase in extracellular fluid volume, these will be released, usually by the heart, target the kidneys to say, hey, we've got too much blood, too much fluid, let's get rid of some. All right, natriuretic. So the stimulus to release these is an increase in extracellular fluid volume, Increase preload. We talked about preload, right? Preload of the heart is the amount of blood coming back, causing stretch. If our heart detects that, it's going to say, hey, we're going to release this hormone, tell the kidneys, like, get rid of some of this water because we're being overworked here a little bit. So that's going to increase our GFR. More fluid's going to be filtered. Therefore, in essence, we're getting rid of more fluid. Does that make sense? All right, so uh, just a couple of examples. If you guys want to go through the rest of them, uh, to test yourself, fine. I think it's a good exercise, but that's the gist of what is happening. All right. So speaking of renal blood flow, I feel like I'm out of breath. Wait, why is no. Because because you want to get rid of fluid, right? So it doesn't matter. Well, one, okay, two, two reasons. One, 
natriuretic peptide is going to affect specifically the arterioles, not the renal artery, right? So renal blood flow will come from the renal artery. The arterioles would be downstream from that, right? We went through that blood pathway. Second of all, uh, if you want to get rid of fluid, you don't necessarily need a lot more fluid going in the kidneys just to get rid of it. Because if you already open that and increase your filtration, that's going to get rid of fluid for you anyway. Okay? So what that also tells you is that the effects of natriuretic peptides on losing fluid is weak compared to, let's say, a diuretic. That would increase renal blood flow. Does that make sense? All right. So, renal blood flow. Both kidneys, about 22% of our total cardiac output. All right. So, a high blood flow. Um, we need a high blood flow in order to have a filtration, right? If we don't have high blood flow, we're not going to filter very much. It's going to be like a stagnant pond. All right. Because of the amount of blood flow that the kidneys are receiving, they're just by diffusion, getting nutrients all over the place, right? Way in excess of what they need, okay? So oxygen, nutrients, kidneys normally exceeds what they're going to need, right? But the kidneys need a lot of energy for one specific purpose, and that's sodium reabsorption. So what does that tell you about sodium reabsorption? Is it a passive process or an active process? It's an active process. So our kidneys work really, really hard to reabsorb sodium, to keep it in our body. Why? Because outside of cells, ECF, we need to have a constant, a consistent concentration of sodium. Why? Because that's the whole basis for action potentials in nerve cells, in muscle cells. So we've got to have a high extracellular uh, sodium concentration. And the kidneys are what allows us to keep that sodium in our body rather than getting rid of it. So a lot of, the point is a lot of energy is devoted to that. All right. Do I need to go over this? We did this with blood, like erythropoietin. So kidneys detect low oxygen. They release erythropoietin. Erythropoietin goes where? Red bone marrow. Stimulates what cells? Oh, that big long word that you can't pronounce. Pardon? No. What cell do you stimulate to make erythrocytes? Pardon? Hematopoietic stem cell. You get more, more uh, red blood cells made. Oxygen goes up, shuts off erythropoietin. All right? We cover that in a blood chapter. So this is just a cheap flow diagram re reminder of that. How are we doing so far? Good? I have a new statement in my chart. I haven't been to the doctor. Weird. <laughs> All right. So, uh, one more thing, I think. Yep. One more thing about the glomerulus before we get go away from that area. We have this little group of cells next to the glomerulus that's called the juxtaglomerular apparatus. All right, juxta means next to. All right, juxtaglomerular apparatus. And that has two parts of it. One is called a macula densa. It's a group of cells that kind of, that's in the distal convoluted tubule that acts as kind of a salt sensor a salt sensor. So that's going to detect changes because uh, salt, sodium, is our primary uh, electrolyte 
you know, related to fluid volume, it's going to detect increases or decreases in osmolarity, right? Osmolarity is concentration of solutes in a fluid. If I have high osmolarity, is that an increase in solute concentration or a decrease in solute concentration? If osmolarity goes up, that's more concentrated. Osmolarity goes down, that's less concentrated. So these macula densa cells detect changes in osmolarity. All right? And when they detect changes in osmolarity, they will signal the cells next to them, called juxtaglomerular cells, to release a hormone called renin. All right, this is important. Renin, not renin. There's only one letter difference between the two. Renin is a hormone secreted by the digestive tract, which we aren't concerned about. I'm so not concerned about it that I don't even remember what it does. Renin. Because you've all heard of this, right? Don't groan. Renin angiotensin aldosterone system. All right. So renin is released based on the osmolarity filtrate. So if renin's goal is to put aldosterone into the system, do you remember what aldosterone does? We, did, we, haven't, we haven't talked about it, but based on your past experiment, experiments, experience, what does aldosterone do? Pardon? That's, that is upstream of aldosterone. Aldosterone causes sodium reabsorption, potassium excretion. Okay, we'll talk about this later on. So, if renin leads to aldosterone, it causes sodium reabsorption. That means when these macula densa cells detect low sodium, low osmolarity, they're going to go release renin and tell the kidneys to hold on to more sodium. Okay? And we'll go through that whole process. For right now, just be aware of the apparatus and what it detects. All right, so that all is related to filtration. Not the juxtacomerular apparatus, but it, since it's in that area, we talk about it. Now let's talk about tubular reabsorption, right? So that's everything that was filtered, and the body says, hey, we don't want to get rid of that quite yet, and they put it back into the blood. All right, so tubular reabsorption is going from the tube filled with what's to become urine and puts it back into the blood. All right, those paratubular capillaries. All right, we have the PCT, we have the nephron loop, and we have the DCT, all of which have different permeabilities to different substances. All right, we're not going to go through all the really, really nitty gritty details of it but at least get a feeling for what overall is happening, okay? So let's start in the PCT, all right? If you look here, proximal convoluted tubule cell, what you notice is a bunch of arrows going that way. So in the PCT, what's your body reabsorbing? Sodium, chloride automatically comes with it. Anybody know why? Balance. Charge, right? Negative follows positive, right? That's why I follow my that's me following my wife around. She's positive, I'm not. All right, that's usually in exchange for hydrogen. All right, calcium, amino acids, glucose, phosphate and water, right? All of those can be reabsorbed in the uh, proximal convoluted tubule. All right, and the fact that you have something going in the opposite direction tells you that all of these things are reabsorbed 
by the anti-port process, right? In exchange for something else, right? And usually it's for hydrogen. What's hydrogen associated with? Acid, pH. So this is a way of getting rid of hydrogen ions as well. <clears throat> Hmm? Whereas symport, you'd be two things in the same direction. You guys are like, I thought I'd never hear those words again. Is there a primary reabsorption like thing? Does it absorb more like sodium or something? No. Okay. Nope. Um, yeah, generally speaking, that's actually a really good question. As long as you have enough transporters to handle the load that's coming, you're going to reabsorb it. All right. So uh, another way to say that is you're going to reabsorb as much as you have the capacity for. Right. So if you, let's say, have a genetic disease where you're missing this calcium antiporter, you may not be able to reabsorb as much calcium and then you'll have calcium problems. I don't know that that ever happens, but just an example. Uh, a good example of that is, let's do the glucose, okay? Uh, there's a whole, yeah, it's on the next slide. This renal plasma threshold is the thing I'm talking about. So let's say, um, we have 10 units of glucose, glucose that got filtered, right? Remember what's filtered is water and everything that's dissolved in it. So glucose is filtered. Should we ever have glucose in our urine under normal conditions? No. Why? Because we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten antiporters for glucose. So if we have ten coming through and all ten can be antiported, then we just cleared our glucose. That's the renal plasma threshold, is ten. That okay. That's a made up number though, right? It's a made up number. So don't go saying Dr. Ray said it's 10. It's, it's proof of concepts. All right, so what happens then? So this, this 10, this 10 uh, antiporters, pretend that says antiporters, 10 glucose antiporters doesn't change. But what if we have 30 units of glucose coming down. That means 10 will be reabsorbed, but then we're going to have 20 that go out in our urine. All right? So if we overwhelm our renal plasma threshold, in other words, overwhelm the capacity to reabsorb a certain substance, that substance will appear in the urine. All right? And glucose is a really good example. So Best example of why glucose would do that? Diabetes. Diabetes. Another example. You got a sweet tooth. Like if you eat so much, so many sweets that you overwhelm your body's ability to process glucose, it will start to appear in your urine as well. Um, unless you're really good about losing the weight, don't try that experiment at home. Do what? Hmm? All right. So that covers this slide, what we just talked about. That whole thing with glucose, that's the renal plasma threshold. All right. Um, and this just tells you that the PCT is capable of absorbing all those things we saw in the previous slide. Uh, we didn't see, I don't think I saw potassium there, but it is can reabsorb potassium as well. All right. Things our body needs. We also have to consider water reabsorption. All right, water is something that is reabsorbed passively by osmosis. So when we are reabsorbing sodium and chloride, what's going to follow? Water. All right. 
So water are the kids. My wife's the positive one. I'm the negative one. Here come the kids. Okay. Um, see, I get ahead of myself. We've, we talked about a lot of this already. Um, so what this is showing you, again, PCT absorbing things. The PCT absorbs about 70% of the sodium, and it's permeable to water, so that means we're absorbing uh, a lot of water as well in the PCT. It's part of what keeps up that volume in the tube. All right. So this exchange, this exchange, by the time you, and we draw it as a straight line, but by definition, what is the proximal convoluted tubule? What does it look like? Right? Why is it like that? So that you have time for things to exchange, right? That's why you have um, a convoluted nature to the tubule. All right? So this is a PCT. You don't have to go to that slide. I'm just, I don't want to draw it. I'm, I'm being lazy. By the time you get down to the end of the PCT and going into the nephron loop, what you have is an isotonic solution, right? Isotonic, relative to the blood. So that means the same concentration of solutes in the blood is what's in the tube at that point. Does that make sense? Because you've gotten rid of, so gotten rid of sodium, Water followed it, so you have an isotonic solution here. You guys remember isotonic, hypertonic, hypotonic? Okay. Where was I? Here? Here. All right. Finally, we have tubular secretion. All right, tubular secretion. Um, what tubular secretion is, is basically your body saying, we didn't get, you didn't filter enough of something. We need to get rid of it. So we're going to have an active process that puts it in the blood. All right. So tubular secretion is getting rid of whatever's left over that we didn't filter enough of from the blood back into the tube so we can get it out as urine. All right, some of these substances, acids, hydrogen ions, urea, organic acids and bases, byproducts of things, all right, as well as potassium, okay? Those are things that are secreted. And remember, it's an active process, so it's going to require energy to get rid of things that we want, we don't want in our body. So... Uh, this is an example of tubular secretion of potassium. Uh, this is governed by aldosterone. Okay, we've talked about that a little bit. Does anybody know what aldosterone does specifically to cause sodium reabsorption and potassium excretion? All right, aldosterone uh, will go to these tubular cells. Aldosterone is a steroid, so it'll go right and cause uh, into the nucleus, cause production of hormones, and it will put sodium potassium pumps on those cells. All right, and sodium potassium pumps do what? Sodium one way, potassium the other. All right, so that's how aldosterone causes sodium reabsorption, because sodium is going to go this way, and potassium excretion, or secretion rather, secretion. So in the collecting ducts, and to some degree in the distal convoluted tubule, potassium secretion is tied to sodium reabsorption, all right, through the actions of aldosterone. This is just one example. And if sodium potassium pump is a pump, it requires energy. Therefore, it's an active process. So a good example. All right, so here's the... Renin-angiotensin system. 
or what we refer to as RAS, renin angiotensin aldosterone system. All right, its primary function, regulate sodium excretion. So getting rid of extra sodium. All right, by getting rid of extra sodium, you are also affecting what? Water, okay? So it's a way of getting rid of sodium and getting rid of excess water or holding on to it, okay? So it all starts with renin, all right, which we know are secreted by these juxtaglomerular cells when the macula densta detects low osmolarity, all right? But the secretion of renin can also be stimulated by a decrease in blood pressure because what's one of the things that can cause a decrease in blood pressure? Low volume. If normally you operate at six liters of blood and now you have four, your blood pressure is going down. Okay? Sympathetic nervous system can directly stimulate renin secretion. Low sodium, we talked about that already. This is what we already went through is number three. Or decreased renal blood flow. So even if you have a normal blood volume, but for some reason you're not getting enough blood into the kidneys, the kidneys are going to go, whoa, we need to hold on to more water, even though that's not the problem. Can you see how that can even be a snowball effect? Okay, to cause higher blood pressure. So let's talk about how this works. All right. When any of these stimuli happen, renin is released. Renin goes into the blood, okay? It's a hormone, right? It's secreted by the blood. Renin converts a protein called angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1, all right? So what this liver shows you is that angiotensinogen is a plasma protein made by the liver. All right? Angiotensin 1 will circulate. It'll get to the lungs where you have angiotensin converting enzyme. This is going to be really important because if you haven't talked about it already in your pharmacology class, you have ACE what? Inhibitors. Did you guys do that yet? Yeah? Okay. ACE inhibitors. So they shut down this process. Okay? So ACE will convert angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. Now, I'm going to argue that angiotensin 2 is the most important thing produced. Why? Because angiotensin 2 can vasoconstrict. Angiotensin 2 can cause aldosterone to be secreted. Angiotensin 2 can cause ADH, antidiuretic hormone, to be secreted, and it can cause an increase in thirst, all of which are going to do what to blood pressure? Increase blood pressure. All right? But since we're talking about the RAS system, we'll, fo we'll focus on this aldosterone part. So, okay, so, well, hold on. If all of these go to increase blood pressure, then we give ACE inhibitors to prevent angiotensin II from being formed. Therefore, we don't have vasoconstriction, we don't have aldosterone release, we don't have ADH release, and we're not very thirsty. Okay? Blood pressure goes down. What? Oh. Well, pharmacologists know a drug, how it works and how it's processed, and what it's supposed to do. The physiology may be a little murky. So if that helped, great. Like, we're, we're right on track. Perfect timing, right? So, I can ask a lot of questions on the exam about this, right? And I'll, I'll collaborate with your farm instructor. Kidding. 
<laughs> All right. Um, so to finish up, aldosterone then, we'll go here, right? Pump sodium one way, pump potassium the other way, cause you to reabsorb sodium. If you reabsorb sodium, water's going to follow and you're increasing your blood volume. Or, at minimum, not decreasing your blood volume anymore. Okay? So that does make sense then. All right, good. All right, so let's talk about how we deal with water. So these specifically are going to have more to do with those juxtamedullary nephrons than with the regular nephrons, but this will happen in both of those. All right, sodium and water. So we're talking about sodium water balance. Things to know. Our PCT, we already know, transports sodium, reabsorbs it, and can secrete it, and permeable to water. So water is going to follow whichever way sodium is going. The descending lip, limp, limb of the nephron loop, this right here, permeable to water, but not permeable to sodium, right? So if we have a high osmolarity out here, large solute concentration, water's going to preferentially leave in the descending limb. So if water is leaving the descending limb, what's the fluid at the bottom going to be like? If you have a bunch of water leaving, very concentrated. What's the term we use for that? Hypertonic. I know it says it. I just wanted to avoid giving you guys more hints. You know, like hypertonic. All right. Then when we go up, the ascending limb is permeable to sodium but not permeable to water. Permeable to sodium, but not permeable to water. So, since you just got rid of a bunch of water here and diluted all this area, and this is permeable to sodium, sodium's gonna be like, well, hey, I gotta replace that concentration. And you're gonna pump sodium out, chloride follows. Okay, so permeable to sodium, but impermeable to water. So you lo actually lose so much sodium that by the time you get to the top of the nephron loop, you now have a hypotonic fluid, very dilute. So if nothing else happens, what are you going to be peeing out? Large volumes of dilute fluid, right? large volumes of dilute fluid just by this mechanism here, okay? So important to remember what's permeable to sodium, what's permeable to water, what happens to the fluid in the tube as it goes through the loop, okay? And at the end, you're peeing out large volumes of dilute water, of dilute fluid, if nothing else happens. What do we, what do we go to next? Nope. Distal convoluted tubule. So we still have more of the tube to go through, right? So that means this isn't the end of the story. We're not going to just pee out large volumes of dilute fluid. All right? The distal convoluted tubule is permeable to sodium. So the sodium will move just by normal processes. But if aldosterone is present, you move a lot more sodium, all right? Where are you moving sodium to? We showed the picture, aldosterone. It's caused in the blood. We're reabsorbing it, all right? So active transport of, so of sodium in the presence of aldosterone back into the blood, okay? What's going to happen to our, the fluid in the tube? If we have a lot of sodium leaving, what's going to follow it? Water. 
So what are we doing to the concentration of that fluid now? Increasing it. So now we're going from a very dilute fluid. We're absorbing sodium. Water's following it. Now we're concentrating that fluid. Okay? Why? Why? We filter six, our plasma volume 60 times, but only pee about 2.5 liters, right? This is a mechanism by which we reabsorb a lot of that water. All right, distal convoluted tubule and collecting ducts, impermeable to water, impermeable to water, right? Important. But will become permeable when ADH is present. What's ADH? Antidiuretic hormone. A diuretic makes you pee. Antidiuretic makes you not pee. Therefore, you're holding on to that water. Okay? Again, allowing you to reabsorb a lot of water, creating a concentrated urine. So instead of large volumes of a dilute urine, which is what you had at the end of the nephron loop, now you have smaller volumes of a more concentrated urine. So you go from the urine that looks like water to urine that looks like lemonade. Actually, if you're peeing lemonade looking water, you should probably drink some more water. All right, so what we have set up is this thing called the countercurrent mechanism. Water leaves, then sodium leaves. What this allows you to do is create a gradient in the medulla uh, less concentrated towards the cortex, more concentrated towards the uh, deeper parts of the medulla so that when antidiuretic hormone opens up the collecting duct, where's it going to want to go? High solutes. So this creates a, lets you create a high solute concentration in the interstitial cells, inter interstitial tissue of the medulla so that you can reabsorb a lot of that water. Does that make sense? because water is going to go, want to go where there's a high concentration of substances. I'm not going to go, I'm not going to explain the countercurrent mechanism. I did put a video, it's the best video I've seen, of the countercurrent mechanism on Canvas for you. I recommend you watch it and you'll be like, oh, that's okay. That's how it's doing it. All right. I want you to know the end point though. The end point is to create a gradient of solutes in the medulla that will allow you to reabsorb large quantities of water. All right, so this is saying the same thing. I'm not going to go through it. We just, I already said all this. This is showing you in pictures if ADH is present. We have this high concentration. Water is going to flood out because it's way concentrated out here compared to what's in the tubule. And question though, if water's going out to this um, interstitial space, how does it get reabsorbed? What do you have also circulating through that interstitial space? Blood vessels, right? So it's going to pick up the water eventually. All right, does that make sense, all of that? All right, we're going to break because I want to break. Um, five minutes, and then we'll start back. All right. The last part of this is the easy stuff. Right? How do, we get, how do we get rid of that fluid now? All right, one thing I want to impress upon you is that in these renal pyramids within the medulla, that's where all your collecting ducts are. And these little green lines that I drew in are all your collecting ducts joining at one point at the end of the pyramid called the renal papilla. And if you dissect a kidney and actually look at that, there is a little hole at the bottom like where the fluid comes out. 
I think this kind of stuff is neat. That fluid goes into these minor calluses, which then feed into major calluses, fills up the renal pelvis, and then fluid goes down the ureter. All right? And we all know where it goes from there, right? You did anatomy to the bladder. All right, within the ureters, there's a mucus layer, lines the inside, uh, makes urine go uh, smoothly. There's a muscular layer because uh, the ureter also has peristaltic waves that push urine down. Uh, and a fibrous layer that holds everything in place on the outside. It's not funny. All right, it is. All right, then we go down to the urinary bladder. All right, a couple things I want to mention about the urinary bladder. Uh, it is a muscular organ, and it contracts, and when it contracts, that's when we feel like we have to pee. All right, it also stretches. That's what we mean by distensible. Distensible, it stretches. And we'll talk about why that's important in the next slide. Uh, it stores urine and then forces it into the urethra to get rid of it, all right? That's its primary function. There's three openings on the inside that form a triangle, all right? That's called the trigon, all right? It's just a, it's not a real triangle in there. It's just an imaginary triangle between those. You guys know how like anatomy has all these fucking triangles all over the place? <laughs> When I first started learning it, I'm like, Jesus, does everything have to be a triangle? <sighs> okay. Um, the ureters, uh, it's, I think it's kind of neat. They actually go into the wall of the urinary bladder, kind of within this muscular coat, and then come out on the inside so that when the uh, urinary bladder starts filling up, Imagine, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> so imagine that, and it start and it compresses these ureters that are you know going through the wall of the urinary bladder, compresses them so that when the urinary bladder is filling up, you don't have reflux of urine. So it's kind of a uh, a pressure uh, regulated by the urine. Uh, valve, if you will. All right. So flows in here, flows down here. This muscle that's surrounding it's called the detrusor muscle. All right. And the detrusor muscle, as it's going to the urethra, forms the internal urethral sphincter. All right. You learned about that in anatomy, right? The internal urethral sphincter is voluntary or involuntary. Involuntary, so that's the one that when your bladder's filling up, it's going to open that, and you're going to be like, Whoop! you know, you got to hold it. That's where the extrinsic comes in. All right. So then, when we open that, the extrinsic, uh, we'll talk about that in the next couple slides. It goes out the urethra and into whatever is nearby. Usually a toilet, but sometimes a flower bed. My daughter, she's nine. God, save my soul. She will get out of the pool. She, I mean, they know they're not supposed to be in the pool. We've established that. So she'll get out. Nobody's looking. Go over here. Pull her swimsuit aside. And... <laughs> What are you doing? And she, and she thinks it's hilarious. Oh my God, she's gonna she's gonna be that girl in college. She's gonna be that girl in college. Uh, okay, we know where they empty, so we're not gonna cover that. Hot. Getting rid of urine, the process of urination is called micturition. I know we have all these weird fancy names. Micturition is simply urination, expelling urine, getting rid of it. 
excreting it, uh, driven by parasympathetic impulses. Okay, so what happens, we'll go to this, what happens is that you have all these sensory receptors on your bladder. When the bladder starts filling up, it's going to send sensory receptors to your spinal cord, which is then going to send signals, parasympathetic, to the detrusor muscle, and the detrusor muscle is going to say, start clamping down. All right, so stretching means you're filling up. That's a signal that goes to the uh, spinal cord, comes back to the detrusor muscle, and that starts contracting. All right, and when that starts contracting, let's go back a slide, opens up the internal urethral sphincter, you start urinating, all right? If you haven't developed control over your external urethral sphincter, you know, you're two and a half years or younger, be potty training, you're going to pee. But once you start developing control over that external urethral sphincter, which is what potty training is, basically you think about it, you control it, right? Then you can hold your urine, all right, through a secondary reflex. Right? Does that make sense? So micturition, stretching, sensory, parasympathetic, contracting, detrusor. Start pushing it out. The interesting thing about this is uh, our urine, our urinary bladder, can hold about 300 to 400 milliliters. I'm going to argue that if you had a dad like mine, it can hold like six or 700 milliliters by the time you're an adult. If you didn't get that joke. That was like, he doesn't stop to let you pee when you're going on vacation. No, we can make it. <laughs> I pee, Dad. Fuck you. <laughs> um, so, what this graph is showing you is that uh, at about 150 milliliters, that's when stretch receptors are going to start sending signals back to the spinal cord, which will then cause contractions in the detrusor muscle. So that starts at about 150 milliliters. So that's when you're like, oh, yeah, I should go pee before we go into the movie theater. i got to go a little bit. As the bladder fills, the volume gets higher. Notice that there are much stronger and much more frequent contractions. All right, so as the bladder fills more, you're going to send more signals to the spinal cord. That's going to send more signals to the muscle to start contracting. Contractions are going to be more frequent. They're going to be more powerful. And that's when you're like, oh, I've got to go, right? And that's when it hurts, okay? So reflex begins about 150 milliliters. At about 400 milliliters, voluntary control fails. So you have... It's not necessarily just the volume. Like we want to say, oh, my bladder's so full, I got to pee. It's also contracting in response to that volume, right? So uh, that's going to push right past that external urethral sphincter and come right out, All right? Uh, my wife, I can say this because I have a wife, that if you have to pee, you don't laugh. You don't. Because I don't, as a guy, I don't know what this is like. So, all right, that's the urinary system. In a nutshell. Okay, I have a weird question. I have a weird answer. Okay, like you know how some people when they get drunk they pee the bed. <laughs> is it because of a full bladder, lack of voluntary control, or both? Both. Yeah. Asking for a friend. Asking for a friend. <laughs> what they all say. I was also about to say, we straight cat people. I was on outpatient, or I was inpatient ortho, like after surgery, and they get out an eight turn of fluid and people sometimes. Yeah. Like 1,400, I think, was the highest I heard. So. 
That 300, that's why I said that 300 to 400, low end. <laughs> um, and you guys saw uh, with pregnancy, like you have the bladder and then you have that uterus that sits right on top of it. And then when that starts getting bigger and bigger with a baby and it's like smashing that bladder down to nothing. When my wife was pregnant with my son, we went out to dinner. She's like, all right, I got to go before we leave. She went. It was a 10-minute drive home. She's like, I got to pee. Like, we had to stop at the park so she could pee. <laughs> Is that where your daughter went? <laughs> she went to the bathroom. No, my, my wife, I told you, my wife's a positive one. She's nice. She's well put together. Like, I'm her antithesis. <laughs> All right, fluid and electrolyte balance. I know this is like not the most exciting stuff, but it is really important to what you guys are going to be doing. So uh, fluid and electrolyte balance. Basically, whatever we take in, if we're in balance, we have to lose, right? Whatever we take in in fluid, we have to lose. Whatever we take in electrolytes, we have to lose because our body operates in a certain range, right? We have a certain concentration of sodium, a certain concentration of potassium, a certain amount of water that's in our body. So we have to make sure that that's regulated really tightly. So that's when we talk about this balance. And I put green in there just to note what is being taken in, red versus taken out, but that green doesn't show up very well. I'm sorry. But it looks blue on your... Anyway. All right. Um, how, do we, how do we get fluid? Usually we're thirsty, we drink something, but we can also get food from water. Food from water. Water from food, right? Like watermelon. Like I was thirsty the other night. I didn't want to drink a cup of water, so I just grabbed a bunch of watermelon. Uh, electrolytes governed by our dietary habits. Like where do we get all of our sodium? Where do we get all of our potassium, calcium? What we eat. All right, fluid output regulated by kidneys. We showed that. Electrolyte output also regulated by kidneys. We showed that, like all that secretion and reabsorption that we talked about. So, uh, again, what we take in has to be regulated by what we put out if we're in balance. If we're not in balance, if something's wrong and we can't get rid of excess, then that can cause problems and that ends up with disease, okay? We've seen this picture before. What was the takeaway from this picture? If you don't have enough fluid, it's going to fall from somewhere. Right. All these fluid chambers are connected, right? Whatever happens in one place is going to affect what happens in another. All right? The thing I want to add to this is we have our extracellular fluid volume, in other words, everything that's outside of our cells, and our intracellular fluid volume whatever is inside of our cells. And by and large, what is the largest volume? Intracellular. So most of our fluid is held within our cells. <coughs> and that's important to remember. All right, average adult water volume, considering all that's about 40 liters. So we are 40 liters of water. All right. Women's body is a little bit less, men a little bit more. That has to do with the difference in fat mass versus muscle mass. All right, here's what I want you to know about electrolytes. I have some that are underlined. Okay. Extracellular fluid, high sodium, chloride, calcium. Those are the big ones you have to know for electrolytes. Bicarbonate is considered an electrolyte. We're not going to consider it here because I want to talk about that with acid-base balance. All right, whatever is high intra extracellularly is low inside the cell. All right, therefore, whatever is high inside the cell is low outside the cell. So the things that you need to consider on the inside of cells Potassium and magnesium, those are the big ones. 
But we'll make this a little bit easier on you guys. Well, first of all, why do we have, what do we call these differences in concentrations across the cell membrane? A gradient, right? Why do we have gradients in our body? To do work, right? We do work. We open up sodium channels, sodium goes in. That's work, all right? What I want you guys to consider is you're going to have large concentrations of these on the outside, low concentrations of these on the outside, we usually don't touch these, right? Whatever we're gonna do to our patients, we have to consider what's extracellular, okay? So, sodium's high extracellularly, potassium's low extracellularly, but if you get low on potassium, that can cause major problems, right? And the low on potassium is low extracellular potassium because you're not really touching that intracellular. Does that make sense? All right, so uh, summing that up, large changes in the electrolytes that are in low concentration have big consequences, okay? Large concentrations in the electrolytes that are in low concentration, large changes, large changes in electrolytes that are in low concentration have big consequences. Um, I don't want to spend any time in this slide. Basically what this says is that uh, this is your normal intake and output of fluid. If you're doing heavy exercise, that all increases. <laughs> I should take this out. It's kind of a dumb slide. All right. This is going to be the important part. All right, uh, question for you guys. Do I care about the actual numbers ever? No. If I do, I will tell you. Acid base, there are some numbers I do care about, and you do have to know them. Here, it doesn't matter. Uh, get very familiar with these boxes, okay? These boxes represent your total fluid volume in the body divided into your ICF and ECF, okay? And we know that there's exchange between them, right? So whatever you do to the ECF is eventually at some point going to affect the ICF. All right, a couple more things. Osmolarity is concentration. So what's more concentrated, this or this? The 8,000 or the 4,000? The 8,000 is more concentrated. All right, see, you guys got this already. Okay. Okay, in a normal state, the con the Concentration of fluids in the extracellular uh, compartment is the same as what's in the intracellular compartment. All right? So that's what we call, what, what term do we use for that? Isotonic. Whatever's on the outside cell is the same as what's on the inside of the cell. All right? You guys have all seen this before. If we take a red, um, red blood cell, uh, generally speaking, what kind what kind of uh, salt do we give patients most of the time? At what concentration? Anybody know? Pardon? Zero point nine percent. Right. So that's the number I'm going to use. All right. That's a, that's the percent of solutes inside of, in this case, a red blood cell. If I put that in a solution that's 0.9%, and this is 0.9%, you're going to have an equilibrium exchange of fluid, right? That's what we call an isotonic solution. If I put this 0.9% cell in a, uh, let's say, 
3% salt solution, there's more solutes here than there are in the cell, right? 3% is bigger than 0.9%, so water's gonna come out and the cell's gonna shrivel up. If we put the 0.9% in 0% solute, like no solutes whatsoever, then what's inside the cell is greater concentration than outside the cell, and water's gonna do what? Go in, and the cell's gonna swell. All right? These are the reasons why you don't wanna to lose too much water or gain too much water. Your cells are gonna shrivel up and not work properly, or they're gonna expand to the point where they don't work anymore. Sometimes they will even lice. Oh my God, not this again. All right, so let's look at this in that box compartment thing. I'm a jig. This is your normal state. These are five choices, okay? Notice you have the same box and all the choices. So what do you think this dotted line means? Pardon? A change, right, a change. All right, volume is on the x-axis, concentration is on the y-axis, all right? If you don't get this during this lecture, I would sit with this. You will have a question on your quiz, you will have a question on your exam that's related exactly to this. All right, if I were to add a 3% salt solution to this. So imagine this is your patient and I give them a saline infusion of 3%. Which one of these boxes, without looking ahead, without looking ahead, is going to best represent what happens? I had two liters of a 3% solution. So think about this, I'm adding volume, right? So I'm increasing my total volume in my patient and I'm adding a high concentration of solute. Which one of those boxes, A through E, is gonna be the best representation of what happens? All right, first of all, when I give this to my patient, Where's it gonna go? Where am I giving it to my patient? One or two? Two. two. I'm giving it here, okay? So if I give two liters to my patient, what's gonna happen? I'm gonna increase the volume. But I'm giving them a high solute concentration. How's that gonna affect this? Pardon? Did I hear leave the cells? Yes. You're gonna have water leave the cells, which is gonna exacerbate that, right? So is A correct? E is correct. Why is E correct? We know that we pulled water here. That's gonna increase total volume. But we're adding a 3% solution. So we've increased the concentration of the extracellular, but because water's leaving the intracellular, the concentration of intracellular is also going to increase. Does that make sense? So. Adding the fluid increased the total volume of intracellular or extracellular, I'm sorry, right? That also increased the concentration because we went from 0.9% to like what, 3 minus 0.9%, point, 2.1%, all right? Water's gonna leave the intracellular to go into extracellular, so what happened here? 
you lose water from the intracellular compartment, right? So you see how that box shifted? And because water left, the concentration is increasing. Only water left. Does it make sense why that happened? Because you're giving it extracellularly. But because of the concentration you gave, that's going to have effect on the inside of the cells, the water inside the cells. Is it going to leave? Is this what would happen in real life? Because wouldn't you have like transporters that could take the solutes from whatever they're giving them and then move it like intracellularly? Say that again. No, because you're giving a, a solute load that's above and beyond what your body can handle. So it's not going to want to put them in the cells. So I get why it's B. Would there be a scenario where B happens? That was going to, like, the volume shift made sense immediately. The concentration which is what threw me off the first time. But is there any way where that's not going to be affected? Yeah. Oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm debating whether or not. Do you want to do one more example? Yes. Okay. Uh, there are a bunch of different scenarios you can put. I mean, and we can we can make that infinity if we want, but there's only a few things you're actually really going to give your patients. One of them is three percent sodium chloride. Right. We, uh, so that, that's the thing. I'm trying really hard, you guys. Uh, I'm used to teaching undergrads general anatomy and physiology. I really want to gear your education towards what you're really going to be experiencing in your clin med classes and clinically. Okay. So that means, if that means I have to leave some stuff out, like let's play this scenario, I'm going to do that. So I, I want your time to be worth it. So this is what happens. This is basically the explanation of what we just talked about here. Extracellular fluid volume is increased because of that two liters. Osmolarity increases because it's 3%. Intracellular fluid volume decreases because it went to extracellular. Intracellular fluid osmolarity increased because it's just the water left, not the salts. All right. So... Let's look at the hypotonic side. What happens if we take this and we add two liters of just water, 0% solutes? No? Oh, you know why? Because you. It's all the same slide. It's just they have animations added. Um, so, right, I'm sorry. <laughs> all right, so let's explain why that happens. <laughs> all right. All right, we're adding 2% or 2 liters of 0%, 2 liters of a hypotonic solution. All right, we're adding that to extracellular. That's going to increase the volume, right? We know that. But because it's 0%, which is less than 0 0.9 inside the cells, we're going to have water shift into the cells. So the volume inside the cells is also going to increase. Does that make sense why? It's the same thing we showed, that red blood cell in a hypotonic solution. Water went into the cell. That's what this is showing. So why did concentrations decrease? Pardon? You added a dilute solution. So you diluted out the 0.9% here, and because the water went into the cells, you're diluting out this 0.9% as well. So now it's like maybe 
0 0.89. Does that make sense? So you increase the volume in both compartments, but decrease the concentration because you added a large volume of a dilute fluid. All right, so the next slide. Increase in extracellular fluid volume because that's where we added it. Decrease in fluid osmolarity, decrease in concentration because we just added plain water. That water is going to go into the cells because the cells have a higher solute concentration compared to the now, the now dilute extracellular fluid. And then the intracellular fluid concentration, because that water is going in there, is going to go down as well. Does that make sense? Like, yes, this is why I think this is boring. I'm not going to go through that one. I'll let you guys figure that one out. This is an interesting one. This one's really interesting. Uh, and I'll just put it up there. You have two scenarios here. Okay? You add two liters of a 5% glucose. What did we change? We changed the type of solute we're using. Okay, we change the type of solute we're using. So if we add two liters of a 5% glucose to the extracellular, we increase the volume right away. Right? We've increased the volume right away. Instantaneously. Okay? Why doesn't the concentration go up? Because we're not using sodium chloride. We're using a different solute. So this is going to just increase the extracellular fluid volume because we're using a different solute. Because this is all based on that, not glucose. All right, but what do we know about glucose? It's a sugar. It's, it's big. Do our cells like glucose? Yes, as soon as we put in that glucose, our cells are going to take that glucose in. Okay, with glucose, trans glucose transporters. This is food for our cells. Our cells are like, oh, yeah. All right, so instantaneously we can increase the volume. But then our cells get hungry. They start taking in that glu glucose what does our fluid now become? We're taking all the solute and putting it into the cells. So maybe this is getting at the question you were asking. What now happens here? What kind of fluid does that become? A hypotonic solution. So we infused a hypertonic solution that then became a hypotonic solution because the cells took, in all, took all the solutes away. All right? So after, we, after the, it goes into the cells, the cells turn it into glucose 6-phosphate. That glucose can't get back out now. So now it's inside the cells. So what happens is this scenario. What does that look like? The last one we did, right? Where we put just water in. Does that make sense? So because we added glucose instead of sodium chloride, we increased the volume, just the volume, but then after a time, that turns into a hypotonic solution and you've increased the volume inside your cells but diluted everything. Okay? That's the danger of giving your patients a 5% dextrose solution. Okay. Well, we got to give them we got to give them fluids. We got to give them fluids. Be careful with what you give them. This is why. You had a question? So, is it decreased osmolarity not only because the cells are taking it up, but because they're then using it? Right. 
Right, they're using it to make ATP, and that's not going to change the solute concentration. All right, so these exact boxes, <laughs> exact, will appear on some form of assessment. Okay, so if you don't understand it now, I'm more than happy to meet with you individually. But I think once you do a couple of practice ones, you'll, you'll get it. Okay? All right. I just want to get to acids and bases, and then we'll call it a day. What do you guys say? All right. Electrolyte regulation. So that's, that's fluid. Like, and then we directly applied it to, uh, you know, giving our patients different types of IVs. What about electrolytes? Remember, I had underlined sodium, potassium, calcium. Those are the most important ones you're, gonna, you're probably going to consider. Magnesium will also be important, but that doesn't go off as regularly as these other ones do. All right. We know that aldosterone regulates sodium and potassium. We saw that. We just did the, the whole, a whole presentation on that. Um, ADH can sort of regulate sodium, but I want you to know that aldosterone is sodium and potassium. ADH is strictly water, strictly water. And for most of the things you're going to be doing, that's true. Uh, calcium is regulated by two hormones, calcitonin and parathyroid hormone. Does anybody know which does what? So we have calcium, concentration. What does calcitonin do to calcium concentration in your blood? You guys remember? No? Calcitonin will decrease blood calcium, and parathyroid hormone will increase blood calcium. How? All right. If we have uh, low calcium, decreased blood calcium, that's what this negative feedback pathway is, uh, our parathyroid glands will release parathyroid hormone, go into the blood, it will go to the bone, increase the activity of osteoclasts. You guys remember osteoclasts, osteoblasts, osteoclasts break down bone, releases calcium, osteoblasts build bone, take calcium out and put it back into bone. Okay, so if PTH is going to increase blood calcium, it's going to increase osteoclast activity and cause calcium to go into the bone. It will also go um, from the bone into the blood. Parathyroid hormone will also go to the kidneys and cause you to conserve calcium. So instead of getting rid of it, you're going to conserve the calcium. Because remember, we saw in the proximal convoluted tubule, one of the things that we can actively reabsorb or secrete is calcium. So it'll have an effect there. Increase calcium. And it can go into the small intestines to say, hey, Let's absorb a little more calcium than usual from the food stuff. Right? That raises blood calcium, goes back, and shuts off parathyroid hormone. If you have high blood calcium, the exact opposite is true. It's going to activate osteoblast, put calcium into the bone. Uh, I had another student that said his way of remembering it is uh, calcitonin helps you keep your bone in sexual reference, but it worked for him. All right, so osteoblast. All right, it'll tell your kidneys uh, not to conserve calcium. That will decrease calcium levels and will somewhat inhibit the absorption in the digestive tract. All right, so that's how those two hormones work. So...
All right, one thing we didn't mention, uh, we talked about the renin angiotensin aldosterone system where if you have a decrease in sodium that activates renin. Potassium ion increases. Uh, what's the problem with too much potassium in your body, in your blood, extracellular calcium, potassium? Do you know what they give you for lethal injection? Potassium chloride which causes an arrhythmia and kills you, okay? So you don't want potassium to get too high. If potassium uh, concentration increases, that can directly signal the adrenal cortex as opposed to going through the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. It can directly tell the adrenal cortex, hey, release aldosterone. That will put more pumps on the distal convoluted tubule, get rid of potassium, but you're going to reabsorb sodium as a consequence. Okay, so a direct mechanism. All right, chloride, uh, we usually don't have to worry about that because whatever you do to sodium, chloride is going to follow simply because of that electro electrostatic uh, interaction. Phosphate, sulfate, um, not, I'm not as concerned about those. In fact, don't even worry about those. Okay, sodium potassium, calcium, and to a lesser degree, chloride. That takes us right to three. All right, so we'll stop there. The first half of Friday, we'll do acid-base balance, do some problems. Um, how many of you, you, you guys said you've done acid-base problems before, most of you? Who has not? Okay, a few of you. Um, we'll pick it up, and then we'll get into muscle physiology. Did I already tell you about muscle physiology? It's not going to be a big focus, okay? Very, very little of that will actually apply to your clinical career. All right, so that's it. You guys, is this it for today? Like, you're done? Oh, that's right.